Well, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Redzina and I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad that you've joined us online to worship uh, with us, Good Shepherd New York. And we pray that this is uh, a meaningful experience for you and that you know that you are included just the way you are. Uh, we begin with a call to worship, a call and response uh, on this Trinity Sunday. And so would you join me in this call? O oh Lord, our compassionate God, you are neither made nor fashioned by anyone. Wonderful beyond measure, you are faithful Father, servant Son, and enlivening Spirit. Holy Lord, beautiful and dynamic, intimately united as a society of love, you are our creator and cause. You are our perfect Savior. You are our intercessor and giver of spiritual gifts. The Lord of all has called us forth. Our triune God has made us good. Hallelujah, bless the Lord. Hallelujah, praise God's holy name. Let us worship God together. Amen. Blessed Trinity 
ti From Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young, at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Zela. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. 
As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
come to my table you're not alone this table is yours this table is mine Christ breaks the bread and pours the wine so we God's holy mystery Jesus he cried out while on the tree Oh God forgive them they cannot see his love forsaken his mercy weak yet at this table we know Christ's peace Mary in morning went to the tomb her heart was broken the stone was too she saw an angel claim Jesus raised the body's gone now don't be afraid Alleluia God's holy mystery God's holy mystery All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality, politics, nor religion, personality, nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure blows out into the world to listen and serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child.
live in the same world, walk in different streets, but I wonder if our paths will meet side by side. So maybe we're different from the outside looking in, but I know we want the same thing. We want peace and love in the end I'm learning, you're learning too I'm learning, you're learning too. I want to hear it from you Let's continue our worship with the generosity liturgy. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. Well, church, now is the time in the service where we share grace and peace with each other. If you are alone somewhere, know that you're not really alone. You can send a text message. You can share grace and peace with yourself. You can give yourself a hug. Um, Or you can share it with the people in your home and the people around you. So grace and peace. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Redzina, and I'm one of the pastors here. Today, our gospel reading is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before I offer my reflection on this, as is our custom, we take a quiet moment to open our hearts to God and to center our own emotional landscape right now in the moment. Uh, so coming as we are with whatever we're feeling and whatever we're thinking and simply laying it on the table honestly. And it's with the hope that this story could speak to our story in a way that we need, whether it's comfort or whether it's challenge, but in any case, helping us to grow in love. And so let us take a quiet moment to pay attention and to open up. Begin by taking a breath. God of love, break open our imaginations so that the love of God would pour in and alter our realities. Give us the hope we need. Give us the power we need. Give us the grace that we need. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today is Trinity Sunday, and it is uh, a day in which we look at the gospel according to Matthew, the final moment in Matthew's story, where Jesus commissions his disciples to continue the work which he began. And depending on what tradition you come from, probably different elements of the narrative pop out to you. For me, someone who grew up in formative years in a Southern Baptist church, this text was known as the Great Commission text, and it was plastered all over the walls, on signs, on Sunday school chalkboards. Uh, it was in all of the literature that was being handed out, especially in the summer, and it was kind of the, the uh, m primary motivation behind just about everything we did. This idea of making disciples, which was also understood as evangelism in my context. But others, uh, you know, maybe in a more sacramental tradition, look at this text, and what stands out to them is the Trinitarian nature of this baptism. Um, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they see here uh, a, a revelation or a, a profound insight into the nature of God. Others see this as the sort of uh, sealing of baptism as a core sacrament of the church. Jesus, up to this point, had been himself baptized, but had not really baptized anyone else. And so this is one of those definitive moments where we have received from Jesus this commission to go and to participate in this sacrament of baptism. Today, I want to tie these all together, this notion of mission, this notion of the Trinity, and this notion of sacrament, especially the sacrament of baptism. Christian faith is essentially an everyday reality that's rooted in following Christ, that helps us to face the chaos of our realities with the bright and buoyant love of God. I'll say that again. Christianity is an everyday faith that is rooted in following Christ, that helps us face the chaotic realities of our world with the bright and buoyant love of God. And I think we see all four of those moves in this story. Notice at the very beginning, Jesus has the 11 disciples with him on the mountain. And though he has resurrected, though he has appeared to them multiple times, the text tells us that some believed and others doubted. And yet Jesus looks to this ambiguous group of people who themselves have a bit of ambivalence toward him and toward the entire project. And Jesus entrusts them with the future of his legacy. He says in verse 18, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now this coming from a man who was tortured and executed by the powers, by the state. The most powerful dominant force in most humans' realities had quenched the life of Jesus. And yet, Jesus had come out the other side through resurrection. And the disciples have been coming to grips with this new reality. What is resurrection? What does this mean? What will this mean for them? What will this mean for the future of Jesus' movement? Why is he leaving? All of these things are swirling in their minds. And yet Jesus assures them that all authority has been given to him. And from that place of authority, he commissions these disciples to be about a particular kind of work. 
And you'll notice that at the very beginning, it says, go therefore and make disciples. Now, because this is the text that was in my Southern Baptist Sunday school room, that was the, the fronted verb, go. And it is here in the translation that we've read today, go. But the reality is, the Greek term here is, uh, it's a participle. It's, it begins as you are going rather than a verb, go. And so what Jesus is assuming here is that as you are going, as you are going about your everyday life, as you go to work, as you raise your children, as you drop the kids off to school, as you meet a colleague after, after work for a drink or for a bite to eat, right? as you plan out your recreation this summer, as you make your plans for the next five years, as you go, make disciples make disciples. And Jesus has an inclusive vision here. Jesus is not just uh, in, informing this, this 11, a uh, group of 11, to go to their own or to go to a particular kind of person and build the movement there. He says this is for all ethne, for all people. And so Jesus has this sense in which as we do everyday life, as we're going about the normalcy of life, again, Christian faith is something that is part of the everyday reality of our lives. It's not pinnacle experience. It's not something we just draw on in the trenches. It's an everyday sort of cadence. And it is inclusive, it's aimed toward all, and it's rooted in making disciples. Now Jesus will spell out what it means to make a disciple later in this text when he says, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. That's what it means to make a disciple. And to be a disciple is to learn how to obey everything that's been commanded us. But we have a problem in a sort of anti-authoritarian age with language like Lord and King and these sort of authoritarian uh, metaphors and this language of obedience. The truth is obedience as, um, as a term, as a concept, has at its root this idea of being able to hear a voice. It literally could be translated hearing or to give a hearing. And essentially what this means is that we have a, a thousand voices in our lives constantly coming at us, uh, telling us what we should think, telling us what we should enjoy or not enjoy, what we should want or not want. So many voices. And what Jesus is teaching us to do in this commission, if we're going to be his disciples, is to turn up the volume of his voice and his teaching and his practice and to learn how to turn down the volume of competing voices and alternative visions. And this isn't out of some sense of like not wanting to be tested. Jesus is just simply saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you have to learn how to turn up the volume of my teaching and to listen to it, to let it take root in your life. Otherwise, you'll never bear the fruit of it. And for Jesus, this is what discipleship is all about. And helping others to do the same is the work of making disciples. And so Christian faith is an everyday reality lived out in the ordinary moments of our lives where we ourselves are learning to follow Jesus step by step, turning up the volume of his voice in our own hearts, in our own minds, but also bearing witness to that voice in the relationships that we sustain. And this not in a unethical way. I think part of the problem a lot of us have growing up in various evangelical traditions, uh, for those of you who have, is the way in which mission was employed in maybe uh, aggressive or unethical ways, uh, ways that used power in, in, in asymmetrical methods or uh, you know, just wielding whatever it is, medical help or some other kind of service in order to get a hearing for a particular message. Or whether it was uh, the manipulative tactics uh, that brought people into a place of fear or brought people into an emotionally vulnerable place and then gave them a message. Um, I think that there is a way in which we need to come back to these texts that were taken and used in the various traditions that we've come from, and we need to be able to restore and reconnect with them in ways that are healthy and ways that I hope are truer to the original intent. And Jesus here has no sense in which his 11 disciples are going to use this great power to manipulate the empire, right? They are under the thumb of the powers. Like they are the great minority. But what they've been equipped with 
by the one who claims to have all authority in heaven and on earth is an abundance of love and a galvanizing commitment through baptism. And so he sends them out, not to do power plays or manipulation tactics or just to grow his tribe for the sake of ego or for the sake of empire. But what is motivating Jesus is what is motivating God. And what is motivating God is love. And so when Jesus says, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded, he's telling them, not only be my disciple, learn how to love, learn how to care for people, learn how to uh, address the poor, learn how to have mercy on those who are hurt and those who are sick, learn how to be generous in a very scarce and greedy world, learn how to include people at your table in the face of an exclusionary culture. Jesus is inviting us to be his disciple and then to go and to make other disciples obeying what he's commanded. Christian faith is an everyday reality that's rooted in following Christ. But now we get the sacrament. Jesus doesn't just say, go into the world and make disciples, but he inf instructs them to baptize these disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, before we get into the Trinity, I want to focus on baptism for a moment because baptism is so important when it comes to mission. It's so important when it comes to Christian identity. One of the things that has emerged for me in my recent study of baptism is the feature of water. And you would be like, yeah, we get it. Water and baptism, why is this new? Well, for me, I think primarily metaphor, the metaphor that's been dominant in my own imagination is the one of cleansing, this idea of water as a cleansing ritual. And certainly that is one of the metaphors employed in the New Testament. But there is another way in which water is used, and I've known this, but I haven't really made the um, connection until I started to read and learn from uh, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. And he writes in many places about the chaotic waters of baptism. The first time water appears in the Bible is in the creation poem. And it's here, this turbulent water that depicts a chaotic scene. And it's over these chaotic waters that the Holy Spirit hovers and order is brought and a word is spoken and creativity emerges, life emerges. And these are the primary metaphors of life and creation, and they continue through the sacrament of baptism. When Jesus himself is baptized, he goes into the water. And as he goes into the water, what happens? But the spirit descends like a dove. Again, the meeting of the, the spirit, the creative and life-giving spirit, meeting the turbulent and chaotic waters from below. And what comes out of all of it is love. Love that leads to life. Jesus hears the words from God, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. You are my beloved. And so here, when Jesus commissions his disciples to this work of baptism, he is commissioning them to continue this cycle, to continue this metaphor, to continue this meaning that we all face turbulent and chaotic waters. So much of our energy in this world is aimed at either uh, avoiding these waters or medicating in the face of these chaotic waters. And I'll bet that you have some chaotic waters right now that are either right here in your face or on the horizon that you're worrying about. We always do. And they can sometimes threaten to overwhelm us. Water continues to be uh, a metaphor like this. Now, there will be no spoilers here, but one of the things I love about the TV series Succession is the way that water features so prominently and so meaningfully. And even there, it does depict this sort of chaos and often coldness. And yet it can also be a place of healing and replenishment. And the same is the case when it comes to the waters of baptism. In the waters of baptism, even in the liturgy itself, we remember chaotic moments associated with water. We remember the Israelites being delivered in the Exodus and going through the Red Sea. Pardon me, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Pardon me. Woo. Maybe Jeremy will cut that out. Maybe not. Either way, what a gift. Um, so 
Israelites go through the Red Sea and uh, the, the waters are parted. They come through on the other side, liberated, and their enemies are vanquished back in the chaos. And in baptism, we are mobilized not to run away from the chaos of our lives, not to shrink in fear like the disciples were doing in that locked upper room, but to face and to engage that which is chaotic and that which is troublesome to our sensibilities. Right? To be a follower of Christ, to be associated and baptized into Christ is to be in the neighborhood of chaos and suffering and the other. Right? Jesus doesn't want us to just wholly huddle. Jesus wants us to move out beyond, again, to all ethne, to all people, he says. And this is the project of reconciliation and healing and love. And so we're meant to baptize people, not as some tribute that you're entering a new holy huddle that's just truer and better than anything else that's come along up to this point. Now, this is a ritual with meaning, and the meaning is rooted in part one, the ability to face and acknowledge the chaos of our lives. But the hopeful thing is the name in which we are baptized, and that is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And on Trinity Sunday, I want to end with this reflection that the nature of God in the Christian faith that is so unique and beautiful and I think healing for our world is this notion of God as Trinity, not as a static unity, not as some lonely being that's out there somewhere that needed something interesting and so entered into this project of creation, but an ever-present and ever-relating being who is themselves love and who exists in this paradox of unity and diversity. The very thing that makes our life meaningful and wholesome through love, this unity and this diversity, is, uh, is being um, rooted in the reality of God's nature. And so we are being sent out into the world on an everyday life basis in the normalcy of our lives to just learn how to take a step one foot after the other the way Jesus would. And as best as we can to invite others and to teach others how to do the same and as much as we are. And as we do this, we invite people to be baptized not because you know we're better than them or they're better than other people once they're baptized but because this ritual means so much it acknowledges we face some chaotic waters but there is a love that can descend upon those waters and bring healing and order and new life and that's the power of the meaning of baptism jesus knows that the, the saving of the world will happen through the love of god and that the love of god will be spread through the world through the people of god and so you and I are called in this great commission to participate in that love as we baptize people and as we reflect on the meaning of baptism ourselves. One of the things I love about baptizing people in our services, and here I am looking at the font right now, and I have so many memories of children and teenagers and adults in our community baptized here at this font. And in every case, the whole community is enriched because we remember our baptism or many people who haven't been baptized start to get a taste of what this baptism means that we are loved by God as we are and that that love can get us through the chaos of our lives this is the mystery of Christianity and it's the promise of the Holy Trinity you know one of the words for Trinity that makes uh, me smile as I think about the history of the doctrine, is this term perichoresis. And it is where we get our term choreography from, uh, but it's also, it just simply means a, a dance, uh, a sort of divine dance. And that is the notion of the Trinity, this divine dance between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these three beings who are uh, one, three persons, one nature, in this dynamic, mutual, mutual loving relationship. And they enter into a relationship with all things through creation. And they sustain that relationship every day in every moment. One of the beauties of the doctrine of the Trinity is God's imminence. That God is not far off or removed from us, but God is 
near us. And we often associate that with the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is always everywhere. But you know, the same thing is true of the Father and of Jesus Christ. And so together on this Trinity Sunday, we're invited to just remember the basics of the Christian faith, that it is an everyday lived reality rooted in following Jesus and inviting others to follow him too, that helps us to face the chaos of our lives, rooted in the unconditional, bright and buoyant love of God. Today, I don't know what the practical applications are for you, but a few questions to get you considering the implications of this text for you in this week. Number one, how are you in relationship right now to discipleship? Do you feel like you are actually trying to follow Christ in the everyday? Or maybe this is something that is not really an everyday thing for you. Maybe it's an occasional thing, a seasonal thing. And this teaching might challenge you to make this more of an everyday endeavor, an everyday focal point. And it doesn't have to be some grand gesture. It's just the little things, the small movements toward Christ-likeness that we can take with the everyday moments of our lives. Maybe some of you are focused on following Christ, but you're not really connected to other people through that lens. And you haven't really been invitational with your life toward other people. And this isn't a guilt trip. I mean, there's good reason why a lot of us don't talk to our friends about Jesus or about following Jesus because we've had so many bad experiences in the past with either the whole idea of trying to convert other people or maybe we ourselves are kind of struggling and fumbling along. And so we're like, why are we exporting something that isn't really working for us? But in either case, I think one of the things to consider from this text is the invitational nature of this faith. And if for some reason, you're not inviting other people into what it means to follow Jesus, to ask yourself the question, why? Is there something maybe uh, lacking, a good news element to the faith that's lacking in your own experience? And in that case, we always go back to square one, our own experience, our own putting one foot in front of the other. And so much of the trap of Christianity, I think, especially in certain traditions, is that it puts outreach ahead of our own personal formation. But then other traditions put our own spiritual formation over any sense of uh, attention or receptivity toward the outsider. And so I think there's this interesting balance between our own walking with Christ and learning to follow and then inviting other people to follow in as much as we are. We can't invite people to follow beyond where we are, but we can invite people to experience the good news that we have known and enjoyed. Last but not least, I know that a lot of you are facing really tough things right now. And I myself am facing a few challenges. And this is a text that reminds us that we, and part of what's intrinsic to our faith is this reality and acknowledgement of the chaos of life. We don't, we aren't surprised by it and we aren't overwhelmed by it. When we feel overwhelmed, we remember our baptism, that we have gone into those waters, having died, as St. Paul said, and that the Spirit of God has met us through love in those waters and has delivered us, risen us out of the water. And so there's this pattern through baptismal living where we face the chaos, we trust the love of God to liberate us, to deliver us, and we keep growing in love. And so whatever you need to hear this morning and however you need to be led, let us make space for that now. Just a quiet moment to ask, God, how are you speaking to me through this story? How are you guiding and leading me? God, we thank you for the transcendent and beautiful love of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, made known and real to us through our baptism. We pray that you would empower us toward a life of following Christ. You would help us to do it in the everyday. We pray this in the name of the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now that we have reflected on the word, we now declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we've declared our faith, we offer our prayers. These are the prayers of the people. As we pray our prayers of the people today, I will hold space for you to name and pray for specific people who might come to your mind. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we draw near to you in prayer this day, trusting that your love changes lives and your resurrection brings hope into the world that God loves. You have drawn near to us and you walk with us through every challenge. We are so grateful for signs of hope in our lives, for generosity and creativity offered in so many surprising corners. As we lay before you the concerns on our hearts today, draw near to those we name and bring the gift that is needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lay before you, Lord, those who are in the news headlines this week in situations in the world where justice and renewal are badly needed. Pray for whatever comes to your mind. We lay before you, Lord, those who are in hospital or care, and all those who struggle with illness, pain, or health burdens of any sort. We lay before you, Lord, families under stress, relationships that are strained, and friends and neighbors in need of reconciliation. We lay before you, Lord, people seeking food, homes or jobs in these hard times, and those worried about economic recovery We lay before you, Lord, those who face discrimination daily and who lack respect and opportunity because of their identity or fear violence in their daily lives. Lord Jesus, we believe that you hear our prayers and will be faithful to our requests and concerns. Help us seize the moments you give us to reach out to our neighbors and show them the love that you have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Now that we've prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Confession is simply owning and naming the ways in which we fall short of love. Love for our creator, love for ourselves, love for our neighbor. And so right now, we invite you into this act of holy memory, asking for the help of God's spirit to focus in on a memory that matters. And as we do this, we do so with an awareness of the message and the life of Jesus, the God that was revealed there, a God who is kind and tender and warm and compassionate and includes us with all of our complexities and with all of our sin. And so in the light of that love, we enter into this introspection and we ask for God's help. And so right now, as best as you know how, simply think of the week behind and allow a memory to come to the surface. And as that memory comes to the surface, simply take responsibility for it. And feel yourself uh, pivot away from it ask for God's help to imagine a different way forward. Let's do this together.
as our memories are coming and rising to the surface of our minds, I invite you with every breath to inhale the love of God and the tenderness, the kindness of God, the patience of God, and to exhale all of those anxieties, those burdens, the barriers that we carry with us, typically rooted in a vision of God who is vindictive, full of vengeance, and even perhaps cold and aloof. I know that you're not alone as these memories are coming to our minds and we feel ourselves taking responsibility and seeking to move away what the Bible calls repent, that we're not alone. And so we enter into this corporate confession together. Would you join me in this? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, dear friends, hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are included, and you are free in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to the meal that Jesus gave us, what we call Holy Communion or Eucharist. And in this meal, we remember and we encounter the grace of God and the power of God in our lives. And so we begin with this beautiful ancient prayer. Would you join me in this? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is a good and joyous thing to say thank you. And right now we consider together the good gifts of our lives. And as we allow our hearts to attach to those gifts, we channel them into praise, which we sense rising, joining the voices of the angels and the archangels of Isaiah's vision, where they say and sing, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your word, that these gifts of bread and cup would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this body that is broken and given, a sign of your love and of your commitment to heal and to save our world. We pray that you would grace us as we receive your love afresh, as we receive the bread. And may we likewise be broken and given as a gift for our world in love. Amen. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and after he blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which speaks a better word than our vengeance, than our retaliation and violence, than our grudges and our bitterness, than our inability to push forward into peace. It points us instead to the way of Jesus Christ, the God revealed there, one that forgives our debts, that sets us free, that moves us toward reconciliation and restitution, that heals our hearts and our world. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of faith. 
Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God. Amen. And now, friends, we receive Holy Communion together. Our practice is in tinction, where we take the bread and dip it in the cup. But those of you who have the elements in your homes around the country, around the world, you can receive and partake as you see fit. We also want you to know that we practice an open table, which means any drawn to the love that we see in Christ are welcome to receive the bread and the cup. And we simply ask you to let this be a gesture of your open heart toward the love that you find there. And one final reminder, as we feast in Holy Communion, we celebrate this union we have, this solidarity that we have with one another and with all humanity. And we open our hearts to receive the grace to live into that this week. Let's celebrate Holy Communion together. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for joining us once again at Good Shepherd New York. Uh, we're glad that you've tuned in and uh, especially grateful to those of you who continue to tune in week after week and consider this a part of your extended community. Um, also to those of you who are living in New York and part of our New York community, maybe traveling or doing whatever, uh, we're glad that you could connect this week as well. A couple things I want to put on your radar as we approach the summer. Uh, in New York, you know, summer feels like it begins kind of the end of June when school's down. But I know a lot of you uh, around the country or around the world have already begun the season in earnest. But in either case, uh, this is a time of year where we emphasize uh, becoming a builder in our community, which is uh, those of you who are recurring givers. And uh, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, we're going to be uh, making uh, an opportunity for those of you who become builders for the first time or increase uh, your recurring gift uh, during the month of June, we will be um, uh, giving you the opportunity to uh, get a, a Good Shepherd coffee um, uh, tumbler. And so uh, if that's something of interest to you, uh, either to support our community or maybe you're just in it for the tumbler. Um, in either case, uh, we really want to grow and uh, expand our builder community uh, during the month of June. And also speaking of the month of June, this is uh, one of those uh, sort of tilt seasons where we go into a, usually what is a, a lean uh, summer season and it really does help uh, every contribution you can make. Uh, if you're able to make an additional contribution in the month of June, uh, it helps us with uh, cash flow through the year. So um, if you are able to become a builder, uh, to increase your builder gift, or just simply to make a donation above and beyond what you normally do in the month of June, uh, we're emphasizing the, uh, the financial health and sustainability of our community. And so if you'd like to participate in that, you can always text Good Shepherd NY to 77977. You can make a gift that way, or you can go to our website, goodshepherdnewyork.com, and you can find the multiple ways that you can give. Um, so we are grateful for your generosity, and we hope that those of you uh, who are tuning in and are blessed by this ministry will contribute to it as well. God bless you, and peace be with you. God has called you to bear witness to hope and goodness. Know that you have been healed of all that prevents you from serving God and your neighbor. Go forth with God's love and blessing to bring the good news to a hurting world. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Just move on. 